embattled Congressman Matt Gates. Matt Gates was one of the very few members in the entire Congress who bothered to stand up against permanent Washington on behalf of his constituents. Matt Gates right now, he's a problem for the Democratic Party, and he can cause a lot of hiccups in passing the laws. So we're going to keep running those stories to keep hurting him. If you stand for the flag and kneel in prayer, if you want to build America up and not burn her to the ground, then welcome, my fellow patriots. You are in the right place. This is the movement for you. You ever watch this guy on television? It's like a machine, Matt Gates. I'm a canceled man in some corners of the internet. Many days I'm a marked man in Congress, a wanted man by the deep state. They aren't really coming for me. They're coming for you. I'm just in the way. Welcome to Firebrand Live. Congressman Matt Gates here. We've got State Representative Anthony Sabatini from Florida joining us in just a moment. But we are in the moment of national malaise. Of course, that being the famous remarks by President Jimmy Carter. Take a listen. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to American democracy. I do not mean our political and civil liberties. They will endure. And I do not refer to the outward strength of America, a nation that is at peace tonight everywhere in the world with unmatched economic power and military might. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways, it is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. Loss of purpose, loss of success seems to be very similar to what we have going on right now. Joe Biden gives a rare interview to the AP recently where he says, as for the overall American mindset, people are really, really down. Their need for mental health in America has skyrocketed because people have seen everything upset, Biden said. Everything they've counted on, upset. But most of it is the consequence of what happened, what happened as the consequence of the COVID crisis. Uh, this view that we have returned to the 1970s national malaise that Jimmy Carter presided over is one not only reflected by many independents, many Republicans on the Hill, even over at MSNBC, Chuck Todd and his guests are talking about how disastrous the Biden presidency has been. Take a listen. We've covered a lot of politics over the years. Can you remember a more tumultuous period? I mean, you have to go back to 68 when we had a summer where you feel as if everything, it, there's just a lot of instability. Yeah. You know, and, you, and you, you're, all this stuff's coming together in a way that feels a little disconcerting. And of course, 68 far enough away that neither of us covered that. No. And that was certainly a time of, of great tumult. Uh, you know, some historians say you have to go back to the Civil War mm -hmm. to find a time when Americans are so angry and so divided and democracy is in such peril. That was the Washington Post's Susan Page joining Chuck Todd on Meet the Press Now. And they say it's as bad as it's been since the Civil War. Joining us now, Florida man, State Representative Anthony Sabatini. Anthony, from your perspective in the Sunshine State, are they right? Is this as bad as it's been since the Civil War? <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, you know, they're going to say a lot of things to make excuses for what's happening right now. Biden obviously has had the worst uh, set of failures in his domestic and foreign policy agenda that we've ever seen. I mean, Jimmy Carter finally gets the good of his grave saying he's not the worst president of the modern era. He's the second worst. <laughs> and uh, they're going to do everything they can to, uh, you know, try to blame the American people. You know, Jimmy Carter tr started a trend, by the way. He was one of the first presidents to really blame the American people for his own failures. Versus looking in the mirror and trying to change change course on his policies, Biden is is continuing that today, and it's always you know whether it be COVID or whatever else, it's got to be some other extraneous 
event to explain the failure of their policy, never just uh, what they're doing. It's COVID's fault. It's Ultra MAGA's fault. It's Vladimir Putin's fault. It's everyone's fault except the party that has unified control over the American government right now, the Democrats. And it's just, it's going to be very hard for, I think, Democrats to convince the American people that while they have had their hands on the levers of power, uh, that somehow it's these external forces that are causing people to have higher grocery bills, higher gas prices, inflation. But we remember Rahm Emanuel, the Obama chief of staff, saying, never let a crisis go to waste. And I wonder, with Joe Biden talking about gas prices in terms of a transition, whether or not they are, in fact, using this crisis to try to control the behaviors of the American people. Take a listen to President Biden in Delaware. My dear mother used to have an expression, if anything lousy, something good will happen if you look hard enough for it. Mm-hmm. We have a chance here to make a fundamental turn toward renewable energy, electric vehicles, and, and not just electric vehicles, but across the board. And, uh, and that's something we should be, my team is going to be sitting down with the CEOs of the major oil companies this week and uh, try to get an explanation how they justify making $35 billion. In the first quarter. Are you planning to sit down with oil and gas CEOs, no. Mr. President? Why, why is that, sir? Because my team's going to do that. Okay. But okay. you did that with retailers and logistics companies and consumer companies. Because uh, I had it already the- done. So, uh, Representative Sabatini, in the great state of Florida, are people more concerned about gas prices or are they more excited about Joe Biden's transition to renewable energy and electric cars? Well, I got to tell you, somebody who talks to hundreds of people in my uh, constituency every single day, it's almost unanimous. You have about 99.9% of people talking about gasoline and inflation, very few talking about the things that the Biden administration uh, wants to focus on, and electric cars and all of this uh, green new energy that, they, uh, uh, that they're trying to rom Emanuel into existence. Uh, so that's that's where we're at right now, especially in Florida, uh, and I assume every state's the same way. So the faster we can get People get these guys out of power and get Republicans in who are actually going to focus on fixing America's issues instead of just trying to uh, uh, confuse people about what's going on. I think the better for the country. Joined by Florida State Representative Anthony Sabatini. Uh, Representative Sabatini has been one of Governor DeSantis' strongest conservative allies in the state House of Representatives. Also, there's rarely a tax you or I encounter, Anthony, that we wouldn't want to cut or suspend. Almost anything that starves the government of resources to be able to grow larger and dig deeper into people's lives, well, we would be for that constraining of government resources. Uh, There's a lot of talk right now about the gas tax. What's your perspective on the gas tax and whether or not some reductions might be helpful or even a moratorium or a suspension of the gas tax might be helpful for your constituents? I think it's probably the single most important issue, both at the federal and state level. We need to make sure we're giving immediate relief to make up for this uh, mismanaged economy that Biden has created. So suspension and moratorium on the gas tax, I mean, quite literally immediately is what we need to do here at the state of Florida. The governor wanted a billion dollar tax cut. Unfortunately, some of our legislators whittled it down to 200 million. But still, the fact that we got something done is very important. But I believe we need to go much further than that. I'm calling for a total suspension on it, uh, kicking into effect immediately. So that way people uh, make up for, uh, you know, get back in their pockets what they've been robbed of. You know, inflation is a hidden tax. It's robbery. And uh, they're being basically robbed by these policies that which are intentional. It's not just incompetence. There's a lot of incompetence in the Biden administration. But in this case, they're actually doing this stuff intentionally. They know that their fiscal policies result in this direct inflation, but they just don't care. I think, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong, the last person to author a billion-dollar tax cut in the Florida legislature was me when I was chairman of the Finance and Tax Committee there. But I agree with you, suspension of the gas tax, reduction of the gas tax, that should be the action that we see from our government. But the reason you have not seen the Biden administration take action on this is because they're worried that they might not get full credit for their infrastructure bill. Take a listen to the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Grantholm, give up the entire game in this response uh, in an interview she recently gave. What's he waiting for on the gas tax? Well, I mean, part of the challenge with the gas tax, of course, is that it funds the roads. And we just did a big infrastructure bill to help fund the roads. So if we do, if we remove the gas tax, that takes away the funding that was just passed by Congress to be able to do that. 
So this is really interesting from a policy standpoint and a political standpoint, Anthony, because they know that this bipartisan infrastructure bill is a total zero with the voters. This has given Biden and Democrats and even the Republicans who joined with them no bump among their constituents, no enhancement in approval ratings. And yet now they won't give relief that is needed to the American people because they're worried that this might drain away all their slush fund resources for their infrastructure bill. Is, is there any case to be made, Anthony, for taking more money right now out of people's pockets so that Joe Biden feels like he gets sufficient credit for something that the American people aren't really that enthusiastic about? Definitely not. And there's no argument that can be made. Uh, obviously, they're searching for political uh, capital and goodwill wherever they can find it. And uh, if that means delaying common sense policies and smart decisions just to try to cover uh, and stop and stop the bleeding, the political bleeding that the administration is feeling right now, they're willing to do that. It's really sad to see. And it also explains why they've focused on some of these uh, extraneous items that the American people, quite frankly, don't care about. They're looking for some political territory where they can try to achieve a win. And so I'm sure we'll bring it up momentarily, but January 6th and, uh, you know, items that are different from the ones that are at the front of the minds of the American people are what they're going to try to focus on. It's everything is filtered through the prism of politics for these people and their dwindling poll numbers, which are the worst poll numbers of any presidency at this point in time, really in American history. It's, it's quite shocking. So you've got MSNBC saying these are the worst times since the Civil War. We've got inflation going through the roof. We ask the uh, Secretary of, the Energy, of Energy, hey, are you going to advance these reductions in taxes to help people? Answer, no. But don't worry, Representative Sabatini, because the left has the response to solve inflation. And you guessed it, it's more amnesty for illegal aliens. Take a listen to Governor Jared Polis make the case for amnesty to solve your inflation problems. We need an aggressive policy response around saving people money. We talked about some pieces of it, uh, getting rid of the Trump tariffs. Uh, we talked about uh, a gas tax holiday. Mm -hmm. I think there's other taxes that can be cut temporarily. Uh, and I also think that we should move forward if we can't get an immigration reform through Congress. President Biden should move forward with uh, DAPA, which is a sister to DACA. We have the 10th, this is the 10th anniversary of the Dreamer program, right. DACA, Deferred Action for Young People Who Grew Up Here. There was a sister program that President Obama attempted to get through, but the clock ran out on DAPA. It's Deferred Action for the Parents of American right. Children. It would address some of the workforce shortages we have today and contribute hundreds of millions of dollars to our economy and absolutely would reduce inflation if we can get that done. That's what they say we need, Representative Sabatini, just more amnesty. And, you know, around the DACA issue, we recall all of the arguments that we had to be compassionate to these children that had been brought, un, you know, unwittingly by their parents into the country illegally. And now you've got left-leaning politicians, the governor of Colorado, no less, out there saying that what we have to do is we have to have a blanket amnesty, not through the Congress, not with a vote of the people's representatives, but by executive action to have all of these people just freely in our country, even though they came here without permission. Is there any argument that amnesty is the solution to rising inflation? Uh, well, to borrow a phrase from American history, I would describe that as voodoo economics. Uh, it actually makes literally no sense. It's totally irrational and it's deeply disturbing. You know, the Democrat Party for decades was always characterized as the pro-working class uh, pro-protectionist party. And obviously that's totally changed. The issue that uh, characterized their party that they sort of had uh, control over for a long time is now squarely within our wing of the Republican Party, which is stopping and slowing down immigration, doing an immigration moratorium to protect the working class. You know, th this is a party that punishes the working class with uh, unrestrained, uh, totally, totally insane, irrational amounts of illegal and legal immigration. It makes no sense whatsoever. And, you know, uh, Governor Paulus, he's really sort of a perfect trajectory of where the Democrat Party was years ago in the Congress. You know, people consider him somewhat more sensible Democrat, more libertarian-esque. And look, he's just completely uh, drank uh, the potion of uh, a full wokeism. The guy is just totally irrational, uh, advancing policies to hurt his own working class voters and doing it just for a political spin. But then again, he's one of the many guys 
that knows that Biden's probably not running again. And so he's trying to get it ahead of the pack so he can be the Democrat nominee in a few years. And you're going to see these guys do this again and again and again. Interesting. You think there's a stalking horse feature where there's going to be the advancement of the most woke policies to try to carve out a, a, a lane in the far left and a potential 2024 run. Uh, did I hear you correctly, Representative Sabatini? You called for a full moratorium on immigration, not just the illegal, but legal as well? 100% legal immigration um, moratorium. I believe that we should have actually done this years ago, uh, and maybe it could have been debated years ago. Today, it's without a debate. What we experienced with the rampant illegal immigration in the last five or 10 years, I think no argument can be made that that's something that we, uh, against that the fact that we need that immediately, as fast as we can possibly get it, no immigration, study the issue, and then maybe in a decade or so, once the working class has been alleviated from the pressure that we intentionally put on, the Democrat Party intentionally put on uh, that part of our economy and our American people, then we can take another look at it. But since the 1960s with the Hard Seller Act, we've uh, we've had a pretty schizophrenic and ridiculous immigration policy that's not focused on advancing American interests, but actually just the bottom line of giant woke globalist corporations. And so we need to reprioritize that and uh, focus on actually helping our own people again. And immigration moratorium is the best way to do it. And it is a crisis here totally created by policies embraced by the left, right? They're saying, oh, you have these children who are American citizens. I mean, obviously, we can't deport their parents. But that is why the anchor baby concept is so dangerous to our country. I do not believe that America should honor birthright citizenship by fraud, by illegal act. I think we actually need to go the other way from amnesty and actually tighten up birthright citizenship so that, you know, the the cartel leaders in Mexico don't just ship their baby mamas across the border so that their prodigy then somehow has the same rights that you and I do as Americans. They they it is not the same thing. Do you believe that there is a constitutional way to potentially uh, deal with birthright citizenship so that a fraud is not perpetrated on our country? Well, I believe the whole thing's been a fraud since the beginning. You know, you've been the, one of the strongest voices in the Congress in getting at the truth about birthright citizenship. Uh, John Eastman, Michael Anton and others have written about it for uh, a, a few years now about its duplicious constitutional history. It was essentially made up whole cloth. And people just started coming in. If you look back at the 14th Amendment, you look back at the actual language of the 14th Amendment about uh, the rights granted to people who uh, were uh, under pursuant to basically uh, under um, existing American laws already. It never was it was never meant to be extended to people who were accidentally born on American soil, but who were not who were not uh, allegiant to the sovereign of the United States, the people of the United States, the government of the United States. And so the whole thing has just been sort of a lie. Uh, advanced uh, out of thin air and needs to be repealed and stopped immediately. Uh, I don't even think we really need a constitutional amendment to do it. We just need a statute. We got to stop birthright citizenship. It makes no sense. And its history is is fake. And just once again, uh, you know, dressed in more a moral cloth. And like a lot of the policies pushed by the left, they'll cover it with moralism. And it's the moral right thing to do. But at the end of the day, it's about advancing the power and the interest of the Democrat Party and woke leftist elites and not about helping the uh, vital interests of the American people. I'm joined by Anthony Sabatini, state representative in the state of Florida, probably Governor DeSantis's strongest ally in the Florida House of Representatives, certainly one of the toughest fighters against lockdowns, against mandates, and against wokeism that we see permeating almost every element of corporate America and big media and government. Uh, CBS went total critical race theory this last Sunday on their flagship program, Face the Nation, or as President Trump calls it, Deface the Nation. Margaret Brennan actually had Ibram Kendi on the show to talk about critical race theory and its imp and the impact of racism on the minds of three-year-olds. Take a listen. For so long, people were taught, be blind to color. Um, you're saying acknowledging this is important because if you ignore it, it allows racism to survive. Is that right? It does. And unfortunately, we, we as parents and, and teachers and caregivers of, of children and just, you know, adults want to believe that. But unfortunately, it's just not true. I mean, studies show that as early as three years old, our kids have an adult like concept of race. They're not only seeing color, but they're attaching it to qualities like smartness, like honesty.
Are you buying it, Representative Sabatini? Three-year-olds are actually born racist, where they look at someone's color and determine how smart or honest they are. I didn't even know that three-year-olds uh, were making an, you know, analytical decisions about relative honesty and smartness. So how dangerous is this perspective? You know, in the eternal war, war of Florida State University versus University of Florida, I think you, you get an extra point over us. Uh, for not ever having Ibrahim Kendi as a tenured faculty member at your alma mater. You know, Kendi taught at UF. Uh, we subsidized this guy for years. It's one of the best arguments for restructuring our university so we're not throwing money at these anti-American, radical leftist people. I mean, three-year-old kids, are you kidding me? This guy is being taken seriously by uh, you know, mainstream journalists and political thinkers and people in the nonprofit industry, et cetera. It's crazy. This guy's got, to be totally honest about it, a, a very hate-filled heart. I mean, their idea of justice in society is structuring things in such a way uh, that we're always thinking in race-based classifications. Everything must be based on race and filtered through race. And that's just wrong. That's quite literally what the American Civil Rights Movement in the 60s was trying to do the opposite of. Yes. And this guy's actually very honest about that. If you read his works, he'll say, I want to sort of reverse the civil rights movement and have a 100% focus on race and racial outcomes. So he's wrong. It's crazy. I wish this guy never uh, taught at UF. Uh, he's moved far beyond that. I think he's Soros funded at this point, or he's got some mega donor that's putting his poison everywhere, apparently now CBS. And the fastest, the best thing we could do right now is get every Republican to, to be, understand critical race theory, understand the threat it is, and, and shut it down, especially in our institutions like we did in Florida. We passed the strongest bill banning critical race theory, not just in government, but also in private enterprises. If Walt Disney wants to try to use that stuff in their HR department and shove it into their employee manual, it's actually illegal under Florida law. What was that debate like? Uh, was it a party line debate? Did you see, were you able to get through to any Democrats, maybe even in swing districts that like embracing a pedagogy that tells three-year-olds that they're racist is not really a productive one to society? You know, it's interesting. You would think if you think if, if the argument was dealt with on its merits, that would have obviously happened. There are always a few Democrats that are slightly more open minded than the rest of the party. But it actually didn't happen in Tallahassee, it did not happen in the wow. Florida legislature because they mischaracterized their position in such a way that they just uh, villainize anybody who could disagree with it. They don't believe critical race theory is racism and is anti-American. They just believe it's this new step in the eternal struggle for social justice and yada, yada, yada. And they barely ever, uh, you know, in very in sort of bad faith way, they, they would never uh, explicitly deal with the language of these critical race theorists and what they're advocating for. Because if you read it, if the, every American can read it and tell this is just fundamentally wrong and un-American, but they, they just don't go to that, that, that level of politics. They just ignore it and, and deal with two-dimensional ideas of what critical race theory is. George on Facebook on the live stream says, when I was three, all I had on my mind was where my next cookie was coming from. <laughs> it's probably more similar to my experience as well. Uh, the, the left tries to tell us that critical race theory is the next evolution of the civil rights movement, a way to get more progress for people of color. But I think you laid it out correctly, and I think a lot of people need to understand this. Critical race theory is a critique, a rejection of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement had as its principal goal Colorblindness, right? That was Dr. King's famous speech about you know, the content of people's character rather than the color of their skin. Black and white children holding hands together. And Kendi seems to say, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to judge people just by the content of their character. We have to recognize that everyone is in this packaging of race and you have to evaluate that packaging more than you know, what someone has achieved. And, and I think that is a very, very dangerous thing for the country. I'm glad that Florida led the way, not just in our schools, but from the classroom to the boardroom to get rid of this toxic poison. And it just is interesting that at a time where you have, and you know, MSNBC saying it's the worst it's ever been since the Civil War, you've got a president with historically low approval ratings. They won't cut the gas tax. Joe Biden says, get an electric car. And then their answer for you is wokeism and amnesty. I mean, that pretty much breaks <laughs> down where we are in the country. And, you know, do you do you think, uh, Representative Sabatini, that that our states are going to have to muscle up 
and use more of their Tenth Amendment rights? Or do you think that uh, if we're able to get the right composition in the Congress, that will actually make life a little easier on the states by creating conditions that allow people everywhere to be more prosperous? I think we're going to need both, but I definitely think there's more opportunity on the states. You know, I always say red states use a tenth of the power that they actually had. What DeSantis' greatest accomplishment was for me, uh, you know, looking at it objectively, was that he basically just kind of showed the country how much all the other Republican governors really just sucked and weren't really (laughs) doing anything. And so he exposed them. And so now they're saying, you know, you see Abbott and these guys saying, well, geez, I got to catch up to DeSantis. I need to use more power. That's power they've always had. Power they've always had um, uh, under the Tenth Amendment, and of course, just of their own volition, and they and they just refuse to use it. And he's exposing them, making them do it. So they need to do that. Red states need to really do everything they can to advance uh, freedom and the America First agenda at the state level. But at the same time, you know, we need to grow our sort of informal America First caucus in the Congress. You know, you and Marjorie and Biggs and Massey and Gosar and all the good guys. We got to expand that and hold the Republican leadership accountable and instill courage in them, because if they had the courage, they can do what's necessary to be done. But right now, it doesn't feel like they doesn't seem like they have the courage. You know, they're looking they're sort of running an anti-Democrat agenda right now. But it's just an opposition agenda. They're not advancing uh, positive policies of what America needs to look like and what we need to do. And I think that's one of the best things we could be doing right now alongside red states using their powers, getting a Congress that pushes leadership to advance positive America first policy, especially when it comes to energy. You're so right. And this was my critique of Republicans during the Obama years. When Obama was president, Republicans were just against anything he was for. And then that gave Obama the ability to essentially craft not only his own agenda, but ours as well. Right. We cannot just be an opposition. We actually have to show people how better choices in government will lead to higher wages, better jobs, more investment in our companies and in our country. And I really think that was the benefit of the Trump presidency. It showed us how good we, in fact, can be. And now take not my word for it, but MSNBCs were, were literally in the doldrums of our country. You mentioned Governor DeSantis, Representative Sabatini, and I want to get to another Florida man story. Uh, big headline in Fox News, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says White House lying about COVID vaccine policy. I've had a number of calls to my congressional office about this issue where Florida is the only state that will not use its state infrastructure to distribute COVID vaccine to children five years old and younger. Give us the update as to the rationale for this decision and your standpoint on it. Well, first of all, the media coverage, this is sort of becoming a a typical, almost stereotype occurrence. DeSantis says something, they lie about it. He says something else. They say that he retracted or corrected himself. And all of it's a lie. DeSantis did something that the Republican governor should have absolutely done. And they should have said this. uh, When the federal government was pushing these new emergency approved vaccines for children less than five years old, they said, you know, no, thanks. We're not going to we're not going to jump into that. It's an, it's under an emergency authorization. We're no longer in an emergency. We don't need it. These small children have a ninety nine point nine nine percent survival rate from COVID. So what are we doing here? Other Republican governors didn't join it, but he boldly did the right thing. Now, once they approved it, he said this statement right before the emergency authorization went through. Once it went through, he said, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if some people want to order this thing, we're not going to stand in the way. We're just not going to go out of the way at the state level to start pushing this thing. And they try to mischaracterize his statements. You know, he's a bold and courageous guy, and he often has to stand alone to do what he has to do. And so the media just jumps on that and tries to mischaracterize his stuff. And we have the best state health surgeon in the country. His name is Joe Lopato. He's a well-respected doctor, and he is actually looking at all the evidence, not just narratives, not just woke medicine narratives that are coming out about vaccine. Remember, these are the people that were wrong on everything related to COVID, okay? You know, at one point they're advocating wearing two or three masks. They were wrong about everything. We were right, and we need to look at all sources. And uh, this is just about disciplining Republicans that want to think differently about public health. And so that's why they, they always are attacking him. DeSantis and the public health infrastructure in Florida has been a hallmark of consistency. Meanwhile, with the CDC and Dr. Fauci, it sort of feels like public health magic eight ball, where you shake the ball and then a different response comes up every time about vaccines, masking, transmissibility, survivability. Um, is, is Florida 
you know, when we when we look at all this, uh, do you think Florida's going to shake out well on the health statistics as well as on kind of the freedom metric that's so important to our people? Absolutely, on both counts. So, you know, at the end of like sort of the height of COVID, we found that Florida ended up having the best response. It was mostly it was the most rooted in freedom of all 50 states. It had the best response on spread, death, illness, injury, all of that. And then alongside that, when you look at the economic matri- uh, uh, metrics, we had the lowest unemployment, the most small businesses, the most net migration into our state, et cetera, et cetera, during COVID. So we won on both counts. And of course, one of the worst states was California, which uh, Governor Newsom of there is always doing everything he can to stand toe to toe with DeSantis and call him out on everything. Yet he has the worst metrics along with uh, Cuomo before he got canceled. So. Uh, We won on both counts. This next step, I think we're going to win again. We're going to show that we can protect kids, protect society, keep the economy open, but at the same time, not shove vaccines down the throats of kids when they're understudied. You know, all uh, Dr. Labado asked for was, hey, before we start pushing this thing, why don't we study this COVID vaccine just a few more years before we mass prescribe it? Of course, they said no, because the uh, economics and uh, woke uh, medicine uh, uh, disciplines were pushing it as hard as they possibly could for political purposes. We have not studied it. We don't know if there's going to be a health effect on these on these small children and on adults uh, either. And so instead of uh, taking his advice, they, sh- they, they did the emergency authorization. And we're already seeing uh, what looks like cir- you know, circumstantial uh, health effects, and w- which is something we should have really slowed down on. And I'm glad Florida stood up for rationality and freedom when it came to this decision. And if you're a parent and you want your four-year-old or three-year-old to get the vaccine, there's there's nothing in Florida that blocks that or renders that illegal or unable to occur. We're just not going to use the apparatus of the state to do distribution on the vaccine. I think that's where the national media has been lying about Governor DeSantis and the policy choices in Florida. They've been saying, oh, you know, now all these people won't have the freedom to uh, make this decision. And in fact, if that's what you choose based on your circumstances, I believe that that's between doctors, families, um, but I support Governor DeSantis's decision, and it sounds like you do as well. Uh, shifting gears to our final topic, Representative Sabatini, the January 6th committee is unconstitutional, unfair, and I would suggest fundamentally uninteresting. A lot of this information was known. A lot of it is baked in. I think a lot of people are still rightly concerned about election integrity as an issue. As a state leader, a state lawmaker, as a political leader in your community, what's your perspective on the ongoing January 6th committee hearings? Well, the two most predominant feelings I have is, one, I agree with President Trump when he says this is a unselect committee of political hacks and political thugs. And the other part of me says, well, this is just also extremely boring. You know, they're doing something that's at one point very vicious and unheard of, which is weaponizing a political, I'm sorry, a congressional committee to try to destroy the lives of their domestic political opponents. But at the exact same time, it's a massive distraction versus the most immediate threats against liberty and prosperity in this country. Our border, gasoline, the failed foreign policy in Afghanistan and around the world. Everything that's happening, the breakdown of the rule of law, uh, you know, got Supreme Court justice death threats happening now on a weekly basis. So all of these really immediate threats are are looming on the American people. And so at the same time, it's it's, it's, it's just crazy distraction. But at the you know, but on the one hand, it's a blueprint they're using. What they're trying to do is very similar to what I read in an article the other day, uh, set something up like the Soviet show trials where. Uh, They don't allow anything that goes against their narrative. They're not looking at evidence to uh, deflate their points. It's just one party controlling the apparatus of Congress and then just trying to label anybody, not just the protesters, by the way, not just the protesters on the Capitol uh, lawn that day, but anybody that has been involved in advancing what we know to be strong claims about uh, fraud in the 2020 election. uh, They want to they want to label them and us all domestic terrorists. And so at, at one point, it's very heinous and disgusting. But at the other hand, it's this it's this sort of uh, political uh, shroud that they're trying to uh, advance to distract us from these other domestic and foreign policy failures, which have characterized the Biden regime. We could really rename the January 6th committee hearings, the betrayal of Liz Cheney, the ongoing betrayal of Liz Cheney, because she's all about betrayal. She betrayed the state of Wyoming when she voted for an impeachment that those folks were absolutely against. 
She betrayed the Republican conference when serving as conference chair, choosing to engage in her own revenge tour against Donald Trump. She even betrayed her own sister when she wanted a United States Senate seat and it was politically expedient to throw her own family member under the bus. And in these hearings, she is betraying our country. She is betraying America by engaging in this just total political theater when we ought to be focused on the issues that are concerning to Americans so that they can live better lives and escape this national malaise. Anthony Sabatini, thanks so much for joining us. Share your coordinates on social media so that folks can stay up with the work you're doing. Thank you, Carson Gates. It's at Anthony Sabatini on every social media platform with truth and Facebook, Twitter, everything. And of course, uh, they could always just reach out to me directly. Uh, through my email, which is afsabatini at gmail.com. would love to hear your thoughts and stay in touch. Representative Anthony Sabatini, one of Florida's very best state representatives, a top ally of Governor DeSantis, a top ally of the America First agenda. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Roll the credits.